He borrowed a ship in which to sit to teach the multitude. He borrowed a nest in which to rest. He never had a home so rude. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. We are so delighted that you stopped in today. Our desire is to provide you with scriptural teaching to bolster your personal walk with God. Trust you'll enjoy the selection. May you receive it with an open heart and a spirit of prayer. God bless you all. It is my distinct honor today to introduce the next speaker, a friend of mine for several years who has graced the pulpit where I pastor, and a man of God, a man that knows how to hear from God, and a man that will give you today the heart of God. Brother Floyd Odom, pastor in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, great man, would you stand in honor of the man of God today? Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. In the book of Luke chapter 24, the Bible teaches us that two of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were walking to a village by the name of Emmaus. Emmaus by definition is defined to mean warm springs. Emmaus or Warm Springs geographically was seven miles northwest of the city of Jerusalem. Two disciples were going on the third day after the death of Jesus Christ. This was the day of his resurrection. But just three days ago, he had been horribly mistreated, ultimately crucified, suffering a terrible death. One of the disciples' name was Cleophas. The Bible declares that he and his friend were walking to Emmaus, and their countenance was obviously very, very sad. As they were walking somewhere between Jerusalem and Emmaus, a stranger appeared to them and asked, Why is it that you walk and are sad? And they responded to his inquiry with this answer. Have you not heard the things that are come to pass there in these days? And the stranger said, what things? Cleophas and his friend responded by saying, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in word and mighty in deed. Now this stranger that joined Cleophas and his friend was none other than the man called Jesus. But Jesus, a stranger to them, was not recognized because the Bible declares that their eyes were holden and that they, they did not know him. Jesus began to teach them from the law of Moses and the prophets concerning himself. By this time, his Bible study was over and their wandering trip had led them to their destination of Emmaus. And the Bible said that Jesus made as though he would have gone further. But Cleophas and his colleagues said to Jesus, now they're stranger, abide here with us. And they constrained him when he made as though he would go further. They invited him into the town restaurant for a meal. And when they entered into the restaurant, the Bible says that when the meal was brought to them, it was nothing but bread. And when the bread was brought to Jesus, Jesus took the bread from the platter of the waiter and he blessed it and then he broke it. Before he broke it, he did bless it. 
You and I are here at because of the times to be blessed. I'm not certain, even as I forced myself to pray deliberately this morning, if I really did pray, Lord, break me. But I did hear myself, myself say habitually, Lord, bless me. As I have prayed for my friends who have graced this pulpit in this conference, not one time did I pray for God to break them, but I did pray for God to bless them. We live, we thrive on the blessings of God. It takes a very keen insight, though, to understand that we really survive when he breaks us, and not altogether when he blesses us. The Pentecostals of my generation, we demand the pulpit to bless us with our preaching. We demand the musicians to bless us with their musical instruments. We demand the vocalists to bless us with their songs. But never have I heard a church member say, break me. Never had I heard a congregation say, break me. We live on blessings. We throw our heads back and lustily we sing, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, but never do we sing broken assurance. Jesus is mine. Again, we sing, I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day that I live, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning or when I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. The word broken just doesn't fit in the rhythm and the rhyme of the song. Brother Jaron Davis, it's hard to fit. I am broken. I am broken. Every day that I live, I am broken. When I wake up in the morning or when I lay my head to rest, I am broken. I am broken. We are a beautiful audience at Because of the Times. However, let's not understand that we are not here because of who we are and what we are. It wouldn't hurt a one of us, gentlemen, to lay on our face before God and pray for God to break our will. Ladies, it wouldn't hurt a one of you to weep tears down your cheek and ask for God to break your will. It bothers me when we come to the Pentecostal churches with our arrogance, with our pride, and with our haughtiness, and we think that we're doing God a favor just because we're coming to church. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you for your consideration. I'm here today because of a man called Jesus prayed in a bloody prayer chamber of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. I would propose to you, it is time for the ministers and the priests of the Lord to stand between the porch and the altar and join the son of Pethuel, Joel, and cry and pray, O Lord, spare thy people and give not thy heritage to reproach. How many times have we demanded, where is the Lord God of Elijah? We have paraphrased that to say, where are the Elijahs? But it doesn't sound comfortable to say, where are the Jeremiahs? Elijah brings fire down from heaven. Elijah brings miracles. Elijah brings ecstasy. And there's plenty of room for that in the United Pentecostal Church. But I've never heard for someone pray, raise up the lamenting prophet Jeremiah. We're not comfortable with tears. We're not comfortable with sobs. But we love the dance. Yes, I do. We love the shout. Yes, I do. But I thank God, Sister Mangan, that you taught me yesterday how to pour it out. I pray that we can be broken before this audience makes history. Jesus Christ was the master breaker of bread. In the book of Matthew chapter 14 and verse 19, before he fed the 5,000 men 
not counting the women and the children bread and fish were placed in his hands but before he broke that bread and fish he lifted his head and he blessed it the book of Matthew chapter 15 in verse 36 Jesus took the seven loaves and before he broke the seven loaves he held those loaves in his tender hands and he blessed those loaves at the last supper in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26 the Bible says and he took bread while he held that bread he blessed it and then he break it and he said to the audience take and eat this is my body which is put for you now as Jesus is a stranger on the Emmaus road we find that he joins Cleophas and a colleague of Cleophas and the Bible declares that when they arrived at the restaurant of Emmaus that when the dinner was brought he held the bread in his hands and until this time they had not recognized him they had forgotten that this was the one that took the, that put the flicker on the eye of the blind they had forgotten this was the one that put the vibration of sound on the ear of the deaf they had forgotten that this was the one that walked the white cap waves of the sea of Gennesaret or Galilee they had forgotten that this was the one that paid a visit to the cemetery of Bethany and resurrected Mary and Martha's brother they forgot that this was the one that had not only raised the dead but put a leap in the leg of the lame had straightened the cripple's feet had cleansed the leper's skin and now when he took the bread and began to break those loaves their eyes were open because they remembered how once before they saw that man break the bread if you want his blessings you've got to understand they don't come free but they come first of all when we are broken I'm not worthy to shout if I cannot cry I'm not worthy to dance if I cannot weep I want him to bless me but if you do nothing else break my will I think I need to make a statement, Brother Anthony Mangan. He's heard me preach this one twice, and I'm here today by his spiritual request. And don't worry about him understanding the mess of crumbs that will be scattered around my feet before I'm finished. Me breaking the loaves of the baker's bread is nothing but a visual. But you and I must understand that we're nothing but dough in the hands of the master baker. You want a revival in your church? Have a broken spirit. You want miracles in your ministry? Have a broken spirit. You want souls in your prayer rooms? Have a broken ministry. You want your altars filled? Have a broken ministry. You want your baptistry dripping with water at every service? Have a broken ministry. Please pardon my pulpit manners, but forgive us of our arrogance. Forgive us of our Pentecostal pride. For Give us of our haughtiness. I pray, oh God, break my will, break my nature, break my attitude that I can be found in his likeness. The prodigal son did not return to his father until his spirit was broken and until he was financially broken. Peter was not the evangelist on the day of Pentecost on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem until he knew what it was like to go out and to weep bitterly. David was not a man after God's own heart until he pled, purge me with his up and I can be white as snow. Jacob did not become Israel until his thigh bone was broken. The room was not filled with potpourri until the woman broke the alabaster box. Barnabas did not become the leader of a New Testament church until he sold 
all that he had and placed it at the apostles' feet. He came to church wealthy, but he left a beggar. But oh, how much more wealthy was he in the things of God. There's a move of God in this room today. There's a move of God in this conference. There's an appeal by the Holy Ghost to the Pentecostal community to tear down our will, to destroy our spirit. I please beg you to forgive me for being redundant, but we cannot preach a good enough sermon to fill our altars. We cannot have a good enough choir to fill our churches. But when God's people that are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face, then he will hear from heaven. I fear that I might be among that group that refuses to be broken. The Bible is star-studded, if you please, with those that could have been broken, but they refuse to be broken. God gave Cain, the oldest son of Adam, and Eve an opportunity to be broken, but he was driven from the presence of God because he resisted being broken. The Bible says Saul lost his throne and lost his crown because his spirit was never broken. Judas is carried you lost your ministry you lost your apostleship because you refused to be broken the rich young ruler turned and walked away sorrowfully because he could not stand to face life a broken a bankrupt pauper and the bible says he went away sorrowfully because he had much I can speak for the Pentecostal movement in the deep south for sure we are blessed above measure we we have the preachers we have the singers we have the talent we have the anointing but that stench in the nostrils of God what he needs is a piece of bread that is willing to be crushed and willing to be crumbled in the master's hands the rich man was dressed in purple and fine linen he was never broken I fear the plight of the nation that I love the United States of America from the Atlantic to the Pacific from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico I love this land with all my heart but I'm disturbed in the sorry direction that we're going politically the direction that we're going socially and the direction that we're going religiously the statistics speak for themselves 4,300 158 babies every year, every day in abortion clinics, 3,219 divorces daily. Not only that, but we've legalized abortion. And Dr. Kaverkian, I would like to make a public statement to you. It's a matter of time until a law is passed, the right to die. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't come with the message of death, but I come with the hope of in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. But to live in Jesus, you've got to die. Let us worship him. Alcohol and alcoholism, crime of every imagination, drug czars, drug zones, drug wars, and drug addiction. Now, from draft dodgers, it's flag burners, homosexuals in politics, homosexuals in pews, and homosexuals in pulpits. Social diseases like syphilis, gonorrhea, and the dreaded HIV virus are spreading across promiscuous America and epidemic-like statistics. Illegitimate children are on the streets of America. Mr. Clinton, Republican Party, Democrat Party, you can't pass a enough laws in the White House nor in the state houses nor in the courthouses to check the epidemic of crime but I know what can change things if we ask God will come to our rescue don't come to me that these prayers are impossible for God to answer he can do it he can do it he can do it if we pray in a broken spirit
spirit nine generations have come and gone since the founders of this great land uh, penned the declaration of independence but few of us if any know anything about the contents of the declaration of independence our nation was born on a pledge made by 56 courageous and brave men who felt that freedom and liberty were worth fighting for and if necessary it was worth dying for these 56 men signed their names to a declaration that would change the course of history. They agreed unanimously. They agreed unanimously. May God cast division away from our churches. May God cast division away from our churches. May God cast division away from our churches. They agreed unanimously. We mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thomas Jefferson, 33 years old. It took him 17 days to draft that text. And the Continental Congress adopted on July the 4th, 1776. King George of England denounced these 56 men as traitors and they would be executed by hanging. But these men that signed, they were not rabble rousers. They were not warfare guerrillas, if you would. 24 of them were lawyers and jurists. 11 of them were merchants. 9 of them were farmers and large plantation owners. Carter Braxton of Virginia, who was a wealthy planter, saw his fleet of ships swept to sea because he signed that pledge. When the war was first finished, he died in poverty and he died in rags. Thomas Lynch Jr. made the pledge. He was an aristocrat, owned a large plantation. After he signed, his health failed. His wife and Mr. Lynch sailed to France only to be captured by the British and to be executed at sea. Vandals looted the homes of Clary, Hall, Hayward, Climber, Middleton, Rutledge, Walton, and Wynette. Thomas McKean was so harassed by the enemy that he was forced to move his family five times in five months. To survive, his family lived in forests and in caves. Thomas Hayward was captured when Charlestown fell. Francis Lewis had his home and everything he owned destroyed. His wife was captured. His wife was raped. His wife was tortured. His wife was imprisoned. But this man Francis Lewis said if it costs me my sacred honor I'm going to have a land of the free. Americans please hear me. I'm not here making a political statement but if America doesn't wake up we are about to take a step too many. If a America doesn't turn around we're going to plunge into a godless eternity it cannot be changed by the politicians but it can be changed by God's praying people thank you Larry Clark I know you're here somewhere and thank you for the nice sweet card that you said brother Odom I'm praying for you and don't hold anything back let it all go then that I will Larry I have come to tell you that if Ethiopia can experience 60,000 three score to be filled with the Holy Ghost in one service it can happen in America if this can happen in Alexandria it can happen in Hattiesburg when we find ourselves broken before the hand of God it can happen John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside when she was dying their 13 children fled in all directions for their lives his fields his grist mills were laid waste for more than a year Mr. Hart lived in the deep forest and the caves after the war that he survived he returned to his home only to find it destroyed his children gone his wife dead Mr. Hart died in a few weeks from exhaustion and from a broken heart John Hancock stood outside the cities of the city of Boston Massachusetts and he was heard to scream to the to the top of his lungs burn Boston burn 
burn Boston, burn Boston, burn. If it costs John Hancock everything that he owns, give me my liberty and give me my freedom. I fear that many of us in the United Pentecostal Church, we may not remember the great sacrifice that my forefathers of this the 20th century invested into me having what I have today. What we're seeing in the United Pentecostal Church did not come by some religious hocus pocus. It did not come by pulling the proverbial rabbit from the magician's hat. But we're here today because of sacrifice. We're here today because of persecution. We're here today because of ridicule. We're here today because of shame. And I'm sorry if I must apologize. I've walked around the sun 48 and one half times and I have not found reason yet to walk away from my heritage. This is the greatest thing that I've ever found. It's the greatest thing the world has ever known. Can we be broken with our pulpit ability? And I think God is nauseated sometimes at our pulpit polish. God is nauseated at time with our pulpit oratory and eloquence. It's nothing but junk. It doesn't matter, preacher, if you can't get your adjectives and adverbs right and your prepositions and pronouns right. The best thing for you to do is to walk out of a hot prayer meeting in an old-fashioned prayer room and don't come and tell your congregation what Matthew Henry says. They could care less what Adam Clark says. They could care less about the Greek and the Hebrew. All they want to know is what does Jesus say? What does Jesus think? What would Jesus do for me? We preach about that man, Jesus, and he was the blessed Christ. He was born in an obscure village of Bethlehem. It is believed that he was the child of a peasant woman, for Joseph and Mary had nothing as far as worldly goods, as far as we know. Jesus Christ worked as a carpenter until age 30. At age 30, he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held public office. He never attended college. He had no home of his own, not even a place to lay his head. Large cities were practically unknown to him. He never did any of the things that normally accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. After three years as a public preacher, the public opinion turned against him. At his death, the executioner scambled for his only earthly possession, and that was his garment. Nineteen centuries have passed since that man woke the shores of Galilee, but he is still the central figure of all the human race, of all the armies that have ever marched, of all the navies that have ever sailed, of all the uh, of all the kings that ever reigned and the governments that ever ruled combined. They have not affected the lives of mankind like that one solitary figure from Galilee who knew the value of a Gethsemane experience when he prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. He's our greatest asset. I know this is just country boy preaching. That's all I are. You're not going to have a move of God in your church if Jesus isn't in charge. Forget it. You can build yourself a pedestal and rule on the throne called your pulpit. But until you lift him up, you're not going to see a move of God. He is our greatest asset. He is supreme. He is supernatural. He is human and divine and infallible and exhaustive, infinite in height, infinite in depth, universal in duration, immeasurable in power, unsurpassed in preaching and teaching, on equal in simplicity, but yet he's personal in application. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the fountain in which the dying martyrs of all ages have cooled their hot faces. Jesus is the pillow on which the saints of all ages have rested their weary heads. Jesus still breaks the fetters of the slave. No time for pulpit hot dogism. But you don't have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous to be delivered from alcohol. 
I'm for the social programs. I'm certainly not taking a pulpit stance against them. But you don't have to be dried out in a rehabilitation center to get off of your cocaine and your heroin and your marijuana. One trip to the cross. I, one trip to the cross. I say Jesus still breaks the fetters of the slave. While we preach against the fetters of tobacco, drugs, sexual promiscuity, and alcoholism, you and I as Pentecostals, we're bound by our fear. We're bound by our doubt. We're bound by our intimidation. Would to God that you and I could raise our chains of fear, our fetters of doubt, and say, come Lord, set me free. I would suggest to you that he who the Son has set free is free indeed. Let's praise him. Jesus takes the heat off all of life's fierce fevers. This is pretty personal to me, Sister Odom. Pretty personal to you, brother and sister Trapani. Pretty personal to you, brother and sister Shoemake. And my wife told me about the birthday. It touched my heart. Jesus takes the pain out of parting. Jesus takes the sting out of death. Jesus takes the gloom out of the grave. Jesus cast out the devils from their synagogues and he also cast out the devils from Gadara Cemetery. Jesus healed the palsy of Capernaum and Jesus healed the lame of Bethesda. Jesus restored the prodigal son. Jesus found the lost coin and Jesus carried the lost sheep. Jesus is the one that is moved with the compassion of the good Samaritan. Jesus pours in the oil, poured in today God. And Jesus pours in the wine, poured in today God. Jesus binds the wounds and Jesus takes care of us. Jesus pays our bills yea Jesus resurrects the widow's son and Jesus resurrects the ruler's daughter Jesus resurrects Mary and Martha's brother and bless your darling heart Jesus resurrected himself either you're sleeping or you didn't hear me the first person did not re resurrect the second person the bible said that jesus declared in john 2 and 19 destroy this temple and i will raise it up again he's the only resurrection and he's the only life i would to god that you and i could have a surge of that holy breath of air to resurrect the power of godliness resurrect the power of holiness resurrect the power of praise and worship we are letting some precious things die on our pews and in our pulpits but the resurrection is here I have watched some of the yawns on your face and mouth as I reflected on what Jesus did in the three and a half years of his earthly ministry. I would propose to you that if you're bored about what Jesus did yesteryear, you can't get excited about what Jesus is doing this year. I say if you're bored about him walking the seas of Galilee, if you're bored about him breaking loaves and fish, if you're bored about him resurrecting Lazarus, if you're bored about him telling Bartimaeus, thy faith has saved thee, go thy way, be healed. You can't get excited about them being healed last night. You can't get excited about the drug addict being delivered. But I come to tell you, he's the same yesterday and today and forever and he changes not let's shout unto the Lord to sum it up Jesus opened blinded eyes to sum it up Jesus opened deaf ears he straightened crooked legs. He straightened crippled feet. 
He straightened withered hands. He cleaned lepers' bodies. And he delivered the possessed mind. I haven't got to apologize for anything. I don't own anything but what God has given me. I've been preaching his name for 30 years. And I fear not to tell you that there is an attack of depression that is visiting personages. There's an attack of depression that is visiting pulpits. And this sweaty proud preacher from South Mississippi has come to tell you that greater is he that is within you than the depressive spirits that rise up against you. I would suggest to you that Jesus heals Alzheimer's and arthritis. Jesus heals low blood and high blood. Come on now. Come on now. I say Jesus will heal all types of cancer. Start at your skull and go to your heel. He's the healer of all thy diseases. And if he can't heal me, he can't save me. But bless God, he saved me and he's my healer. Jesus heals diabetes. Diabetes. Did you say diabetes, Odom? What about in 1974 when your five-year-old daughter Lorinda was afflicted with insulin-dependent diabetes and she still takes injections every day of her life? Are you going to stand there and say, preacher, that your God heals diabetes when your baby daughter, Amanda, one year later, 1975, she was smitten with the very same disease, treatable, yes, incurable or curable? No, I have come to serve the spirit that represents diabetes this notice. Jesus still heals diabetes. And I don't say that to make you feel good. I say that to make me feel good. He heals emphysema, he heals encephalitis, he heals fever, and he heals gout. He heals Hodgkin's disease, he heals jaundice, he heals lupus, he heals meningitis. You're not going to like this one, but he still heals nervous breakdowns too. He heals Parkinson, he heals palsy, he heals polio, and he heals paralysis. He heals rheumatism, he heals psoriasis, cirrhosis, and sclerosis. He heals broken hearts, broken lives, broken homes, broken marriages, broken churches, broken ministry. <laughs> Break me, not my will, but thy will be done. After everything that they did, or he did for them, everything, I cannot imagine. Anytime Jesus went to church, you expected something to happen. Is he here today? I'm doing my best not to shout. But if I obeyed the Holy Ghost in me, I would cut a rug right now. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries hallelujah. Woo! And just in case you're asking, I've got a right to praise him. I've got a right to shout. Ain't nobody got the right like the children of the Lord that seen the light. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was on the road to despair, but I'm on the road to glory. Let's shout unto the Lord. Regardless of what he did for them, 
when their hour came and they had an opportunity to take within their grasp the bread of life he was afflicted a man of sorrow a man acquainted with grief he was betrayed and he was bruised for my iniquities the chastisement of my peace was upon him and even with that in mind they condemned him to death at a religious kangaroo court he was crowned with thorns and he was crucified he was despised and he was forsaken he was grieved and he was hated laughed at mocked and then he made his grave with the wicked first he made intercession for the transgressor next he was numbered with the transgressors he was oppressed he was persecuted he was pierced and sister Mangan, i read it again last night then he poured out his soul unto death he was rejected and he was reviled he was spit upon he was stricken he was slaughtered he was sacrificed he was tempted and he was tried he was whipped and he was wounded i'm gonna try it but dr clipper is gonna come help me from an uneducated standpoint this is what happened to him because of the thorns in his brow a throbbing headache racked his head scalding fever sent him in chills and rigors because of the multiple lacerations and wounds on his body mucus and phlegm ran down his nose and he coughed it out of his mouth because of the slamming fist of roman soldiers in his belly waves of nausea broken and you want to come strut in it because of the times and I want to come and prove how pretty I can preach it because of the times and we want to sing to each other and tell everybody everything is doing fine when I'm talking about my Savior with waves of nausea in his stomach I'm talking about him not being able to hold the convulsions he dry heaves until the remains of his last supper is vomited out on his chest blood oozing from his ears blood oozing from his eyes entrails hanging from his side because of the beating of the cat of nine tails a ruptured appendix a ruptured spleen ruptured intestines a ruptured liver a ruptured heart and well if i got to say this and be uh, careful with it here he is on my cross and your cross he cannot control his kidneys he cannot control his bladder and if it embarrasses you i beg your pardon but his own urine ran down his body because they was going to see to it that he was going to be broken once and for all if that doesn't embarrass you this one will what the vomit didn't put on his chest his bowels could not be controlled and his own body ficus soiled his body don't come to me and preach a pretty calvary don't come to me and preach a religious calvary calvary was dirty calvary was repulsive calvary Calvary. The Romans. The Romans copied the art of crucifixion from Carthage. It was one of the most cruel, inhumane methods of execution known to man. Jesus Christ arrived at the hill of Calvary after hours of deprivation of food, desertion by his friends, and no water. He was so weakened by the Roman scourging that you described, Brother Odom, that he couldn't carry that wooden beam. Six feet long, 30 to 40 pounds, he couldn't carry that from Pilate's house to Golgotha. 
Simon of Cyrene, a North African, was commanded to carry the cross of Jesus. It was placed on the ground and Jesus Christ was thrown on top of it, striking his head, driving the thorns deeper still into his scalp, causing more bleeding. His arms were stretched wide and five-inch Roman spikes were used to nail his wrist to that wooden beam. That wooden beam with the full weight of his body was lifted by the Roman soldiers, dropped into the top of the patibulum, the standing portion of the cross. One foot placed on top of another and a nail driven between the metatarsal bones of his feet. He was broken, but no bone in the body of Jesus Christ was broken because John wrote, and we are known in Psalms, it is written that no bones in Christ will be broken. It is possible to drive spikes between the metatarsal bones and the radius and all the, with no bones being broken. I believe that. He was now suspended from the cross and his weight was suspended from the nails in his wrists. His arms formed a V as he hung there. But very soon, titanic spasms, Charlie horses marched up the muscles of his forearms, the biceps muscles of his chest, the anterior muscles of his chest wall. These are accessory muscles of respiration. As you sit there and breathe this morning, you're using your diaphragms. But when you exert yourself, these muscles help elevate the thorax and increase its capacity. And with those muscles fixed in the titanic state, he couldn't exhale fully. He could only inhale. And so the panicky feeling of the shortness of breath forced him to transfer the weight from the nail in his wrist to the nail in his feet. And he stood up on the cross. Soon the unbearable pain of supporting his full weight on the nail in his feet and the spasms of the muscles of his legs made him slide back down the cross again, transfer the weight to the nails in his wrists. Can you sit there with your eyes dry and hear this? This is a medical report. Calvary was ugly. Calvary was horrible. Bless us, Jesus, but never break us, Jesus. Every time he moved up and down the cross, the median nerve in his wrists rotated around the nails that were in his wrists sending fiery messages of pain to his brain. The rough wood of the cross abraded those open wounds on his back as he moved up and down. Birds of prey dug at the open wounds on his back. In the darkness, insects buzzed around his head, settled on his face, a face covered with a mixture of blood and spittle. It's ugly, Brother Odom. That Roman centurion and the lictor had no mercy. Isaiah said his visage was so marred. More than any other man, if you'd seen him 24 hours before and then seen him then, you wouldn't recognize his face. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What are you looking for? A pretty Pentecost? We don't offer that. We offer prayer and fasting and tears and hearts. But we are filled with the songs, blessed assurance. Oh, reverberate across the walls of our spirit. Broken assurance. After six hours, six hours of moving up down the cross just trying to breathe he commended his spirit Baal in the temple was written twain and the earth trembled the usual method of death from crucifixion is asphyxiation 
Once a condemned man no longer has the strength to raise himself on the cross, he dies from the inadequate respirations produced by the chest wall muscle spasms. So the Romans, to hasten death, would break the femurs or the tibias, and with the broken legs, then the man can no longer raise himself on the cross. Some men lived as long as 24 hours, if you can imagine that. Jesus lived, I'll say, only with great reservation, six hours. John gives us a clue about that when he says that as they pierced his side, blood and water came forth. I won't take time to go into detail, but Jesus, I think, had a huge pericardial effusion around his heart that produced, it's the same kind of injury we see in people who don't wear their seat belts and hit the steering wheel, and fluid accumulates around the heart. Congestive failure sets in, and the breathing that I'd tried to describe to you before was compounded by fluid in his lungs. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed you said it best brother Odom it was my cross it was your cross Jesus Christ God incarnate God walking in shoe leather went to Calvary instead of me I praise him for that He borrowed a ship in which to sit to teach the multitude. He borrowed a nest in which to rest. He never had a home so rude. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. The crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. He borrowed a room on the way to the tomb, the Passover lamb to eat. They borrowed a cave for him a grave. They borrowed the winding sheet. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. The crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Preacher, preacher's wife. No, no, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. Now, I'm happy all the day. Lord, save you, hear my cry, hear my cry, hear my cry. Trembling into thy arms I fly. Oh, save me at the cross. I have sinned, but thou hast died, thou hast died, thou hast died. In thy mercy let me hide, oh, save me at the cross. Nothing pretty about the cross. Though I perish, I will pray, I will pray, I will pray. Thou of life, the living way, oh, save me at the cross. Thou hast said, thy grace is free. Thy grace is free. Thy grace is free. Have compassion, O Lord, on me. And save me where they broke you. He said it. I didn't. First of all, not one member of his skeleton was broken. But he said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Brother and sister Trapani. 
in memory of your two sons, brother and sister Shoemake, in memory of Jimbo. And if there's others here on this wintry afternoon that would hear me speak that has said goodbye at a hurting, lonely cemetery, as Sister Odom and I did less than two years ago, I thought I knew how to be broken when I went on a three-day fast. <laughs> I thought I knew how to be broken when I would pray all night occasionally. I thought I knew how to be broken when I would stagger out of my pulpit after a weary Sunday morning and a weary Sunday night. From preaching in both encounters, I would lose 10, 12 pounds a Sunday. Fluids literally seeping from my body because of pressure and exhaustion. I was in your section, Brother Simpkins, on that fateful night of May the 11th. Covington, Louisiana, minister's wife and seminar. You housed me at the Holiday Inn down at Covington, remember? Yeah. 2 a.m. that morning, my daughter Lorinda called and with a scream, she said, Daddy! Daddy, Amanda isn't breathing. Her heart isn't beating. I awoke from my stupor. What? What? Amanda is dead. No. No. I threw my clothes on, threw my belongings in my vehicle. I needed gas at the adjacent Shell station. Brother Marcella, you may know where that station is at. I put in $10 worth. All I had was a 20. I threw the 20 at the register and ran for my vehicle. And up the highway, I went as fast as it could go. My heart pounding within me. God, this isn't true. No, God, spare me this. She's never saw, known the depths of sin. She's never worn makeup. She's never worn excessive jewelry or jewelry she's never cut her hair she's never gone to the worldly places a, a good christian girl her dad is doll the office receptionist the sunday school teacher why not take a drug addict why not take a prostitute why not take a slut that was pounding in my soul as I drove the three and a half, supposedly three and a half hours to Jackson that I covered in an hour and 45 minutes. I ran to that baby's bedside and they had miraculously, after 45 minutes, doctor, of her not breathing or a heartbeat, they found a heartbeat. And I ran to her side and kissed her and loved her. And I just knew this was the beginning of a great miracle. But the day wore long and the day wore hard. They put her on dialysis, and the nephrologist said, this is the only hope, and I think if we get her kidneys functioning, Amanda may turn the corner. Man, I couldn't hardly wait. This was the news that I was waiting for. The nurse came out and said, Brother Odom, I've got good news for you. She's responding. Her vitals are doing better. I called my mother. I said, Mom, Amanda's better. I think we're going to pull through this thing. As I was still on the phone talking to my mother, the doctor and a host of medical people came running to me and said, Reverend, Reverend, you've got to come. My wife and I joined close at my baby's bedside with a host of ministers and friends that were there with us. And I just can't tell you how I felt when I watched her little lungs breathe the last. And I saw her little body twitch the last. But one thing I knew, I knew that I was in the hands of the bread breaker. My dreams were being crushed. My hopes were being crushed. She was precious. I loved her so much. Now, I'm not trying to work on your emotions. I'm just telling all of you good folks that's never been to the altar of brokenness, get ready. If the Lord tarries, your time is coming. It's either fall on the rock or the rock will fall on you. I well know that my time has elapsed. Okay, can I take a moment longer? With much grandeur, we preach about Paul. He gives us his pedigree in the book of Philippians, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, an all-American kid. A Pharisee, zealous concerning the law, I was righteous and blameless. Man, I was converted outside the city limits of Damascus by Jesus Christ himself. 
I speak in tongues more than you all. I was baptized by Ananias, the great preacher of, of Damascus, calling on the name of the Lord. I would serve my apprenticeship under the son of constellation, yea, Barnabas. I become a prophet and a teacher at the Apostolic Church of Antioch. I was a successful evangelist, a successful missionary. I cast out devils. I prayed the prayer of faith. I preached to Agrippa. I, fe- I preached to Felix. I preached to Festus. I started churches in Athens and Berea and Corinth and Derby and Ephesus and Galatia, Iconium, Lystra, Macedonia, Philippi. Everything I did turned to gold. But that's just what you see on the surface. Behind the scenes, I'm in labor some more abundant. I'm in stripes above measure. I'm in prisons more frequent. In deaths off. Five times received die from the Jews. Forty stripes save one. Three times Oh, we want to have the Paul's ministry, but we don't want to go with the shipwrecks with Paul. Give us your blessings, Paul, but don't give us your breakings, Paul. Brother and sister Shoemake, I didn't even ask permission of you. But when my wife said that yesterday was Jimmy's birthday, I cried for you last night. You see, birthdays aren't something to look forward to anymore, are they? They're dreads. Just we dread that May the 6th. That's my baby's birthday. There's no more cake. There's no more candles. There's no more balloons. There's no more gifts. No, not on May the 6th. But you see, we kind of commemorate death day, May the 12th. What did I lose when I lost that baby? I lost, first of all, a beautiful smile. Thanksgiving turkey and dressing just doesn't taste as good as it used to. Christmas lights and tinsel doesn't blink as bright as they used to. A lot of loneliness feel with my Christmases and Thanksgiving. I lost a sweet smile. I lost a youthful laugh. I lost her wedding day. I lost grandkids she was going to give me. I lost it, man. Brother and sister Simpkins, may God bless you today. Sister Klepper, you may not be aware of this, but I asked your doctor husband if it would be okay if I would have prayer for you. I just sense there's a need of a touch of the Lord in your heart and life. Don't jump at that. I'm not spookism, folks. But if you're here today and you feel like that everything is falling apart, your ministry is dull and dead and drab, you walk out of your pulpit feeling worse than what you felt when you went into it. You dread Sunday morning, Sunday school. You wish that Sunday night would never come. And it's not because you're backslid. You're just under it, man. You're reeling. You're just under it. He led me shunned. Be not weary in well-doing. Give me that chair, brother. Be not weary in well-doing for in due season. You'll reap if you faint not. The cross isn't pretty. The, pro- the, the cross isn't dignified. Did you really come out to hear polish this morning? I almost brought me some shoe polish to the pulpit with me to show you some polish. What I'm doing today is somewhat embarrassing, but because I'm doing it for the man who did it for me, it brings no embarrassment to my face. I wouldn't be here today had it not been for a man that carried my sins and carried my load. Come on, preacher. Waited under the load. The cross is never comfortable. It can never fit on the shoulder just right. The cross is never. It's just always awkward. It's always out of place all I want you to hear me is that if you got the cross on today put your bread in the hands of the baker and don't worry let him break you let him break you let him crush you let him humble you you will arise you will come back you will be anointed you will be used brother Anthony I've been preaching too long. It's at times like this I look at myself and I say, my God, what have I done? I looked at my wife and my last words to her at the motel this morning. I said, baby, I hope I don't embarrass you. Then look what I've done. Then look at this mess. Broken assurance. Jesus is mine. 
Oh, what a foretaste. Glory divine. I am broken. And if I'm not broken, Lord, let me break myself. If my will is carnal, let me break myself. If I'm slipping around living a double standard, let me break myself. If I'm not what I portrayed to the public that I am, let me break myself. Let me take you to church with me real quick. Jesus went to church in his parabolic ministry, Brother Trapani. Come now, Brother and Sister Trapani, we're going to have a great day. And here I am preaching about one baby gone. Why aren't you the one preaching this sermon, sir? You qualify. You have a double portion of my grief. I yield to you, sir. Jesus went to church in his parabolic ministry. And he, he, he gets us in quietly. And shh, shh, shh. Listen. Prayer meeting over here and prayer meeting over there. Listen. And over here, prayer meeting is... Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. Come on, preachers, take off your mask. <sighs> Quit lying to us. We know it's not being doing quite as great as you want us to think it is. You have happenings in your church like we all do. Don't pretend that you've got the perfect little group praying over here. Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. Why? Let me tell you about me. I pray and I fast and I give my tithe and I, I'm, I'm not unjust. I'm not an extortioner. I'm, I'm a great guy. I'm, I'm really the church member that you've got to have. I am the spoke and the wheel of your church. Without me, your financial committee is in trouble. Without me, your social committee is in trouble. You really need me in your church, Lord. I'm a great guy. Jesus said, shh, 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 shh. You know, This side, we go behind the shadows. A dark, dim corner. There he stands, unshaven, uncouth, and unkept. He doesn't have the vernacular and the language. He doesn't have the heritage, the education, the wealth. All he has is a sad sob story. And if you listen, over the last two centuries, three centuries, yea, anybody for 19 centuries, I can hear him pray. Seven words. Lord, have mercy. A sinner. And in the wreck and the brokenness of his life, he smote his breast. Have mercy on me. Wait, wait, let's go to church one more time. This time it's offering. Ah, the wealth that you're giving. Sister Mangan. I want to say thank you for taking me in your heart and loving me. Sister Rodham and I will never be grateful enough because you loved us and you've known us for years, but you have a way of just taking us in. Sister Vesta Mangan, would you work with the preacher for a moment and just slowly walk across the front here with me a time or two? Just this way once and back to your seat, would you? And here come a little old widow woman to church. Uh, no fat check account, no CDs, no, no stocks and bonds. She probably just left the cemetery where she said goodbye to the husband of her youth. And with weeping tears, the place she felt like that she needed to go was to the house of the Lord. And Jesus was watching the tithe payers and the contributors to the offertory. And here she come, just left the cemetery. And all she dropped in were just two little mites. She came with two mites, but you hear me, preacher, when she left church that way, she left broke. She left broke. Brother Kilgore, there's some things in me that's not broken yet, but I want them broken.
I just can't afford to leave because of the time. I don't want to be the same old Floyd Odom I've been. Brother Tenney, you, I was that one lost sheep. I was that lost coin. I was that prodigal son. Oh, I guess a thousand other preachers can stand and claim that honor too from your sermon. But I don't want to leave tonight when the service is over and not be broken. Broken. Break me. I love you. Break me. We're going to see her again, baby. Oh, what a happy, glad day that will be. Brother and Sister Trapani. Daniel, he lost his daddy. Brother Arnold, catch, would you break a loaf of bread around him for me? I'll pay the laundry bill on the carpet. Brother and Sister Trapani, I don't mean to break your heart, but we're going to get through this thing. Brother and Sister Shoemake, maybe the next birthday will be celebrated on the streets of gold. You talking about a birthday cake. Break me. Break me. Break me. Break me. And I'll leave my notes on the desk. I'll come back in a minute. To our knees, please, to our knees. Now, will you go with me? Now, will you forgive? Now, will you reach with me? Now, will you suffer with me? Now, will you give it your all? Now, will you go with me? Now, will you reach with me? Now will you let me be Lord of all? Now will you go on? Now will you go on? Now will you love one another? Now will you reach for one another and restore one another? Now will you forgive one another? Now will you try to save one another? Now will you pour it all out? Will you throw it all down? Will you give it all to me? Let me be your Lord because I'm on top of everything. Give it all. Give it all. Give it all. all. 